JB Knowledge Podcast Network. On episode 57 of the Insure Tech Geek Podcast, talking about insurance on the move with Ori Blumenthal from Voom. The Insure Tech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives into tech we see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. It's beautiful, blue, blue sky, sunny day, getting warm and humid here in Texas. It's about time to migrate north for the summer, Rob. I'm not sure I can handle this much longer. It's getting warm. I'm starting to sweat a lot. It's starting to finally get nice. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you like it. You like it hot and humid. That's why you moved to Texas from Michigan, man. It's like, mm, tell you what, it's, uh, it is something else. Uh, how, how are things with you this week, Rob? Doing good. Yeah, this is kind of my time of year. Uh, it's still still get the spring rains. Uh, the launch is sprouting up unbelievably and all that. But uh, yeah, I feel like kind of shaking off the winter funk and excited that summer's coming. Nice. Yeah, in, in complete non-insure tech news. But in Texas news, the Starship SN serial number 15 was able to take off and fly to 30,000 feet and then land without blowing up yesterday. That was exciting down here, down in South Padre, uh, which is evidently now the, uh, the, the global spaceport to Mars is Texas. How, 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 how appropriate, how appropriate Texas will be the gateway to Mars. That was an exciting, uh, exciting. If you haven't watched the video, go watch it. Uh, and then go watch all the previous explosions of all the other starships that, uh, launched and then blew up in some, way shape or form this one didn't blow up so it was a good day in south texas uh yesterday uh with us from israel uh and also a very uh tech focused society focused on uh, aerospace tech defense tech i mean i i see some crazy cool stuff come out in the area of uh, space satellites technology uh, of course in sure tech uh, from Israel, Ori Blumenthal. Ori, how's it going today? I'm great, James. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's it's a great honor to be a part of the very respectable uh, <laughs> audience and uh, guests that you have uh, on the show. So uh, thank you, James, and good to see you again, Rob. Yeah, no, it's great to have you on here and certainly appreciate you taking the time. And I uh, know it's a completely different uh, time zone over there. Uh, a little little later in the day, it's early in the morning here, but uh, we are we're glad to be able to hook up with you guys and talk about insurance and insure tech and all the machinery and software and machine learning that uh, that drives insurance on the on the back end. Uh, certainly, something I've spent a lot of time working on that you're spending a lot of time working on. Uh, just a reminder to all of our guests out there before we get started with the interview: don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast if you're watching on Twitter or on Facebook, or you're watching on Vimeo, or on LinkedIn, uh, remind that you can subscribe by texting Geek Out to 66866. Make sure you never miss an episode. So back to Ori Blumenthal from Voom. He is the co-founder and chief technology officer there. Uh, that is VoomInsurance.com, V-O-O-M, VoomInsurance.com. Uh, Ori, let's, wait, before we talk about insurance and insure tech, let's talk about you for a second. Uh, you went to school from 06 to 09, got a bachelor's in physics and comp sci from the Hebrew University. Then you got an MBA in finance from Tel Aviv University. And then you, you continued to to work as a, as, as in real-time uh, software engineering, uh, DSP team leader. You worked in cybersecurity R&D team leader. Uh, then you were a co-founder and CTO of uh, Skywatch AI, which we're going to ask about. So you, you've, had, you've had some really interesting jobs in, uh, in technology. Um, what did uh, let's go back before that uh, because obviously technology has been an interest of yours when you were a kid. I'm assuming you grew up in Israel since you went to school there your whole life. Uh, what did you dream of doing as a kid? So I think that um, growing up, I thought about being a fighter pilot. Um, not very tech techy, not very geeky, but that was kind of my, kind of the dream I think. Uh, but then growing up, I kind of understood well that's probably not going to happen. My dad is an accountant. So I almost went down that route, but somehow I I was saved in the last minute. Uh, I was lucky enough to be accepted to an elite 
um, Air Force Academy program. And that's how I kind of kickstarted my career. Uh, and that's where I did my bachelor degree and the other, uh, some of the things you noted. So I, I was uh, saved by the bell uh, just before becoming an accountant. I know. Well, I got a degree in accounting, but never became an accountant. So uh, I, I, I wanted to learn about business, probably the same reason you got an MBA in finance. It's just good to learn about how business works. But uh, actually auditing, I, I, I did an internship in an audit division. I was like, I'm glad that there are people that want to do this, but I am not one of them. I want to build technology. Uh, now, you, so you worked in defense for a little bit, I'm assuming? Yeah, I spent most of my uh, career in uh, the intelligence corps. So that was a, a part of the, the program that I attended. And then uh, I was a software uh, engineer, later a team lead and, and managed the most talented people that I know. Uh, some of them are with us today at Boom. So that's a, a great honor and privilege for us. Yeah, there's a lot of great technology that commercializes out of the Israeli Air Force and the Israeli military. And honestly, I wanted to be a pilot, too. And I ended up becoming a pilot, just not a military pilot. <laughs> so I I get to fly. I just I just uh, I just fly in in, in much smaller uh, planes than the than the uh, than those than those Air Force fighters. But but I I I love flying. And actually, I'll tell you this: modern aviation is extremely geeky. Uh, let me just tell you, you're you're basically flying a giant computer in modern aviation. And so uh, there's a lot. I, I think uh, when you come over to Texas, not if, but when you come over to Texas. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take you up and show you how automated all the systems are, and you're going to say, "Man, that was some that was some that was some geeky stuff." So you learned a lot. You met some great people. Uh, no surprise. Uh, you, you deep dove on cybersecurity, which is a major issue. How did you pivot from that in 2015 into this uh, Voom Insurance and Skywatch? And first, just explain the difference between the two. They're both on your resume. I'd love to hear about them. Right. So basically. Um we kickstarted as Skywatch AI with our first product and later rebranded to Voom Insurance just so the name would kind of encapsulate a broader vision as we, as we have. Um, today, Skywatch AI is uh, uh, still up and running. It's our uh, uh, drone insurance and, well, a- aviation-related insurance brand. Uh, it's basically today we're... We're insuring, uh, I would say, uh, we're the, the, the best digital insurance for uh, uh, drones and light aviation. And we still have some very, very big plans in this space, uh, but also in, the, in, in a broader vision, that's where we kind of created the Voom brand. Awesome. And, and look, drone insurance, I'm a commercial drone pilot. I have a bunch of drones. I, I In fact, there's usually one within reach of me, and there just happens to be one of my older babies here in, in Reach, uh, it turns out a Phantom 3 and a Phantom 4 are, are uh, plenty good now with all the software to do just about anything you want to do with a drone. And so uh, I, I really kind of turned on to hourly drone insurance uh, a, a while ago. Uh, drone Deploy is my favorite um, base, you know, uh, base application to use for all, all my mission planning. And they actually integrated with a bunch of uh, insurance companies so that while you, when, when you're about to fly and, and plan your mission, you can buy insurance on the spot from one of their integrated partners. So certainly I, I see at Skywatch, you guys have uh, you know hourly on-demand, monthly, annual plans for insurance, which is awesome. Let's pivot. I mean, because I think, I think Skywatch is fairly self-explanatory. It's hourly, monthly, and annual drone insurance. Uh, let's talk about, about Voom. What was the, the problem statement behind Voom? What, what problem do you really think you're solving there? Okay, that, that's a, a great question. I, I think that basically, um, let me just say a, a word about Voom in general, and we can uh, take it from there. So basically, we're a full-stack digital insurance company. Uh, we specialize in creating and distributing innovative products for a new mobility segment, uh, which is kind of a well explanation needed here. Um, but we are focusing on data-driven and usage-based insurance product um, designed for high-risk, uh, but uh, episodic use uh, mobility verticals. So that could be drones, e-scooters, e-bikes, motorcycles, light aircraft, and, and more. We typically operate as an MGA. We're licensed in all uh, 50 states. Uh, so that's kind of a, the, the, the one-liner, I would say. And the problem that we're facing, and the world is actually facing, is that the mobility world moves much faster than the insurance industry. 
And those new types of mobility or new ways of mobility or new uh, ways to consume mobility, rideshare and, and, and you know, the, all those uh, e-scooter fleets, and et cetera. This industry moves in a rapid pace, but insuring them is, is a problem. And the insurance industry is lagging behind. And this is basically the gap that we want to bridge. And the way we do it is basically by creating our own digital uh, insure tech stack and enabling and connecting the dots between the different players, between the users, the platforms, the insurance companies, and everything in between. That's awesome. And, and so you're, you're not really providing a tech stack to other carriers. You're operating as an MGA and then distributing your products through, uh, through broker partners. So, uh, basically speaking, yes, we're, uh, typically operating as an MGA. We, we have done some, let's say white labeling solutions for, uh, uh selected partners. Uh, but typically, yes, we distribute the, the, the product. Now we actually do it in an omni-channel kind of way. So natively, we have a strong uh, team of marketeers. So we do the digital distribution and direct to consumer as well. But we also found that working with the brokers instead of trying to fight them, you know, partnering instead of uh, uh, trying to combating them is actually a, a very good approach. So we also emphasized on building, and it was relatively easy for us because of the we built our own board in the cloud. Uh, policy admin system. So for us, kind of playing around with that is the the bread and butter. So we were we were able to build a broker portal. So not only distributing the product by ourselves, but also allowing to onboard um, brokers, and that has been successful so far. Yeah, that's awesome. And and, and look, we've seen quite a few digital MGAs uh, come through the doors of this podcast. Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of innovation there. Uh, it's, it's pretty challenging to get the capital to be a carrier, uh, to pull off what, uh, maybe some of your fellow Israelis at Lemonade did, right. Uh, that requires an incredible amount of fundraising. Uh, I do have to ask, are you, are you selling outside the United States? Uh, are you actually offering your own products in Israel? Yeah. So, uh, we're, uh, typically, uh, so we're licensed as an insurance producer in North America and the U S and in Canada, uh, and outside of those territories, Usually we'll go with the white labeling solution. So in, in Israel, for example, we have partnerships with some local carriers also uh, uh, in Europe, et cetera. That's great. So what would you say, uh, look, this, it's an interesting time in, in, uh, in human civilization. There's, there's more ways to have a machine help you move around than I would argue there ever have been. I'm one who, when I, when I travel, I like to try everything out. So I've, I have ridden on every scooter company I've encountered. Uh, I own a Segway. Uh, I mean, I am one of the nerds who owns a Segway and rides it around. I get made fun of by my, by my office neighbors in downtown Bryan all the time for riding. Uh, Rob, they secretly, and they told me once, they secretly hope that I fall down. They even say they sit in the window and place bets on whether I'm going to ever bust. And I, and I haven't, knock on wood. But there's a lot of ways to get around. Electronic scooters and Segways and Eventually, quadcopters. I noticed you have, of course, general aviation. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to move around. And, and all of those ways, turns out, like one of my friends was on a Segway, and she ran into a car, and then and she, was, she was on a Segway tour, and then sprawled out over the car. And then the Segway tour company tried to disavow any responsibility or liability from that claim. The car owner wanted uh, to be com compensated for the damage the car caused by the Segway, and my friend uh, ended up, <laughs> of course, uh, you know, falling across the hood and bending it in. And so uh, then who pays for that, right? Like there's, there, there's, a, there, there's a complicated legal question. If I run into a car while riding my Segway or I switch to a, to a you know, electronic scooter, or there's a, there's a lot of ways to move around. <clears throat> They're a lot more dangerous. You're moving a lot quicker, and this is a lot heavier equipment. And so there's obviously a need for alternative product insurance, right? And the same thing with drones. Drone ownership and usage is exploding. I mean, it's just going exponential. And so, uh, and, and it turns out they can actually hurt people and damage property. So they need insurance too. So there, there's certainly a, a, a market. How are you approaching it differently uh, than, than everybody else? I mean, do, are, are you really changing the way data is collected and the way claims are managed and the way you're underwriting? I mean, what's, what, what, where do you think the real opportunity is there? Yeah. So first of all, the short answer is yes. But uh, basically what you're saying is that insurance is complicated. <laughs> and I, 
I won't disagree. <laughs> I won't disagree. And the example you gave is a fantastic one because if you read the fine prints of most of those scooter companies, for example, once you ride it, you basically waive their uh, liability. So if God forbid you, you hit someone or you cause damage to the property, basically you're on the hook. Uh, and until you'll have both, let's say, third-party liability insurance and personal accidents insurance, then you're, as I said, you're, you're on the hook. So first of all, be careful. But uh, yes, so to your question, we are uh, taking a slightly different approach. We like to, to think about it as InsureTech 1.0 versus 2.0. And InsureTech 1.0 is a magnificent thing. I'm not saying it's not. And it's basically touching the way insurance is distributed and the um, relationship between the provider and the user. And I think the user experience for insurance has been improved dramatically in the past few years. Uh, and it's a good start. But now, and this is what we call InsureTech 2.0, sorry, is basically providing uh, a deeper change and not only affecting the way that the product is distributed, but changing the, the basics of the insurance product itself, whether that's via different coverage types, via different options, different pricing, and different data points being collected to affect all the above. And regarding uh, uh, the, some of the things that we do, then yes, we collect a lot of data, uh, we analyze it, and then we, we, can, we are able to provide a more tailored insurance experience and a better pricing uh, for our customers. And also uh, when we handle the claims, then uh, definitely we, we are in a position that we know much more and we can collect much more data and, and analyze it in a meaningful way in order to expedite and again, providing a better user experience, that's, that's true, but by leveraging the data in order to um, expedite the, let's say the claim adjustment process. Does that result in faster claims paid, lower premiums? What, what's the end result? Okay, better customer experience is a wonderful thing, but what does that actually result in for the customer? Are they gonna pay less? They can pay the same? Are they gonna get underwrit underwritten faster? Are they gonna get their claims paid faster? What's the end result for them? So I want to say that people will pay a more accurate price. It's not necessarily less, right? I think that for most users, uh, I say that 90% of the people think they're uh, above average, right? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, most people will pay a more accurate price. And for a lot of our customers, that means, yes, a cheaper price and also getting the, a, a better product for their needs. Uh, and yes, eventually uh, getting paid faster because uh, we'll be able to adjust the claim and understand everything that happened, God forbid, in no time. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Rob? All right. It's great to to reconnect. So we were talking uh, off air before we started recording that uh, we had the privilege of meeting uh, a couple of years ago at, at a few different events here, uh, one up the road at Dig In in, in Austin, Texas, at least up the road from, from where I'm at. And uh, you know, ITC and, and others. Um, obviously, a lot in the world has changed uh, since we were last together. What I remember about our conversation when we first uh, were introduced was uh, really the the pivot that you were making at the time from Skywatch uh, to Voom. And, you know, my words, right, kind of this epiphany of, hey, all this technology and infrastructure that we've built for uh, drones and, and, and aviation risk can be used for this broader mobility category that you've talked about. Maybe you can just walk us through, particularly if there's any uh, startup founders out there. I often say that founders, I, I've never met a founder that uh, articulated a problem that I ever felt like, oh, that, that's not a problem. Nobody needs to solve for that. But um, oftentimes what they initially solve for is not the ultimate outcome, right? There's twists and turns along the way. It's, it's certainly a, a journey. And so I'd love to have you maybe share a little bit about your journey, particularly uh, in the last year or so as uh, you know, the world has, has changed, has boom evolved. For sure, for sure. So first of all, yes, it's great to reconnect. I remember meeting in person, if that's even a thing now. <laughs> I don't remember when was the last time where people traveled and the uh, conferences, there was such a thing, right? Um, in any case, uh, I think maybe the last time we saw each other was, uh, I was a guest at one of your, uh, book signing events, uh, great book, by the way, a, uh, a shout out to you, Rob, but, uh, you've mentioned a few things. You've mentioned how we kind of evolved and you mentioned the twist and turns and, and you've mentioned co-founders. So I'll, 
I'll answer that in a broad sense. So first of all, I, I want to um, say a word about twist and turns. And being a startup, it's never an easy thing. It's a roller coaster, right? And if you, if I'm talking to those young co-founders out there, they're just starting a company. The number one tip that I can give them is find the right partner and find the best partner. Uh, I think co-found your co-founder is maybe the most significant thing you'll have in your journey. And this is a great opportunity for me to mention uh, Tomer, my co-founder and CEO. We've known each other for over 15 years now. Uh, we're, we were at the same class in our um, Air Force Academy program. So I even dare to say that we are friends, uh, not, not only co-founders, which is a great thing. Uh, and without this special bond between co-founders and, and having really a core, strong core team, that's really hard. So that's, that's first of all, regarding the, the twist and turns. So I think that's my number one um, message to uh, people that are starting startups. And a bit about the, the way we went through. So coming from, you know, building uh, Skywatch. So I would say that, as I said, uh, um, I'm basically an, a tech geek that turned into insurance nerd. But the core team, we're, we're tech geeks, right? So when we built the Skywatch product and the platform, that was, well, that was a focus for us, right? Building a strong tech, strong foundation, a robust but super flexible system that will be able to, you know, handle different types of coverages, different types of, of uh, usages. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned hourly, annual, monthly, uh, call, liability, um, med pay, whatever. So we want to, we want our system to be robust and kind of take care of everything. Um, and we built that for, for the Skywatch brand. And then people started saying, wow, you do drone insurance. That's so cool. How about boats? How about e-scooters? How about, and, and basically, as you said, there was an epiphany that, you know, the tech that we've built and the know-how that we have and the way we are positioned now, all across the board, marketing, support, uh, tech, licensing, whatever, uh, there, there's more to it. And the, the problem of drones is just a one example of the bigger problem that I described before of new mobility. Uh, and ever since, we've, we've kind of went out, out on a hunt to solve a, you know, more of the mobility problem. And this is what we're working build, digital diligently on, sorry. Yeah, that's awesome, Ori. I really appreciate you uh, sharing that. Uh, just as a follow-up, maybe you can speak to some of the unique challenges associated with covering each risk. So, you know, conceptually, right, mobility, it makes sense. James talked about some of the the liabilities. I, I'm imagining him going around. Uh, maybe he's got a mall cop uniform. Uh, he rides down downtown uh, Brian in, but um, you know, maybe you could just talk about some of the unique uh, risks or challenges with uh, some of the different mobility solutions that you insure. So I think there are, there are multiple, obviously, but I, I will focus on a few. So first of all, let's let's talk about the customer journey or the customer profile. Oftentimes, and, and James mentioned using on-demand insurance or uh, hopping on a rented scooter. So imagine the, the point in which you want to buy the insurance. Well, you have to consume a lot of information about what is the insurance you're buying. It needs to be super easy to purchase. Usually insurance takes you know forever to fill out lengthy forms and getting a lot of data, which most of it is outdated, not relevant. So you really need to kind of focus on those points who are who really matters, uh, be able to take it quickly. Ideally, if I can take, James mentioned drone deploy. So we are uh, on the drone deploy marketplace uh, with, our, with our app. But so you mentioned drone deploy. So if I need to be able to collect as much data as I can from the platform that already knows things about you, so your journey with me will be much quicker, much shorter, and maybe I can leverage data that no one else can. For example, your riding experience, but also your riding data, right? The telemetry data from the drone or from the e-scooter or from the motorcycle or from whatever. So I can leverage this data and to be able to price you much better, even without knowing, well, I, I might know your whatever gender, age, et cetera, but even without those criteria that are used today, I can I, I can better underwrite uh, with other data sources that I have. So that's maybe 
one of the challenges. And the other thing is, again, the different types of usages that you have. So you have owners of scooters, you have, uh, and, I, and again, I take uh, scooters as an example, but you have owners, you have uh, people that are renting it and commuting every day. You have people that are renting only when they travel uh, and, and, it's, and it's different and the needs are different, but also the way you can cover it, cover them is different. And this all requires a much smarter process, but also much smarter product at the base of it. Thanks, Oria. Let's let's geek out for a second. Let's see. My first insurance tech gig was 2004 building inspection software and inspection technology for underwriting inspections for residential and commercial underwriting inspections. And ever since then, I've been pretty neck deep in policy and claims management software, which we've, we've been building proprietary and off the shelf um, uh, claims and, and, and policy software for quite some time. There are some very large dominant players in policy and claims management. <clears throat> uh, they're big, they're expensive, they're hard to configure, right? And they charge a boatload of money to a whole lot of con, uh, uh, to, to a whole lot of the uh, insurance carrier business. Uh, on your website for Voom, you talk about the fact that you run on your own proprietary in-house home-built policy system, which is no easy feat in particular considering the number of lines that you're writing. Walk me through. How much of your tech is proprietary? So, I mean, are you using your own in-house claims management? Are you using your own in-house policy management? Um, if so, that is a huge feat. Walk me through that process of building that and adding all these specialty lines. Of course, I'd love to. So, as I said, and, and uh, I was waiting to geek out here. <laughs> um, so, as I said, uh, we're I'm a geek, right? Uh, and the tech is the, the thing that I do best and what we love the most. Insurance is, is the problem that we're solving, but the tech is is my uh, my uh, high school sweetheart, right? Um, so we built. So you asked how much is is proprietary, and I would definitely say that uh, the policy admin system is all proprietary, uh, both for the all, all the process of the distribution, the APIs, the binding, the issuance, the payments. Everything is is, is in house. Um, Regard, specifically regarding claims, then we typically um, uh, create the F FNOL, the first notice of loss, uh, and we uh, not necessarily adjusting the claims ourselves. So that's a part that we less focus on. But other than that, in terms of the distribution, whether that's a mobile app, uh, a web app, or via uh, brokers uh, and all of the policy admin system, it's all ours. And I think that this is key in order to solve those complicated problems that we talked about, because if it wasn't the case, you know, if you look at an, at an insurance company, IT, you know, their IT debt is so high. And, and for example, just, you know, minor stuff that you don't even think about. I, I was talking to an insurance company providing, we wanted to work together, but they told me, yeah, but I cannot produce a policy that doesn't start at 12.01 a.m. This is how my system is configured and we can't change it. So those are the type of problems that IT folks, but also product people in the insurance industry need to face because they go to their IT people and they this is the response they're getting. So how can you do an hourly policy if it needs to start at 12.01 a.m.? Do you only want to ride your, your uh, um, recreational vehicle at 12.01 a.m. for an hour? Or maybe you want to do it at, you know, 3 p.m.? That, that's not a crazy thing to ask, right? Uh, so basically we had, uh, we see it as we had no other choice, but developing it our, on our own and kind of building from there. Uh, and that that's basically what enables us to A, uh, interact with other data sources in an easy way because we know how to configure everything and to take everything into account, but B, be able to create in a super fast uh, way other additional products and other lines. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really where you see people really stumble and where I've seen tr traditional mainline carriers have a really hard time with rolling out innovative product is the sheer amount of time it takes to configure and deploy a new line of coverage in a new state 
right? Because it's like it's like a two factor multiple: new line of coverage, new state. And so, if you want to roll out a new line of coverage, you got to do it fifty times, right? And 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 each one of those may take a month. I mean, I've seen it take longer than that in some traditional policy management software. Um, are you I, I, by by really controlling this process? It sounds like you're able to move a good deal faster. So it's great that you can you can really revolutionize something. And that's something Rob talks about in his book is part of the cost of insurance is just chewed up by the sheer amount of overhead it takes to roll out new lines of business. I remember that part, part of your book, book, Rob, where you just talk about the, the, the sheer inertia of the operational inefficiency of adding lines of business in states and an insurance company uh, dramatically drives the cost of insurance up, doesn't it, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. One of the fundamental misperceptions I think that a lot of people have is that insurance is slow to adopt technology, where I actually argue the reverse is true, right? They were actually some of the earlier adopters of technology. It just so happened that it was, you know, 1970s mainframes that did a lot of batch processing that lead exactly to that 12.01 a.m. Uh, uh, policy issuance. And so they've built up this technical debt for years and years, and and I you know try to make the analogy to a credit card, right? Over a certain point, you know, hey, just paying down the the minimum payment on your credit card is is a challenge if you've racked up enough debt, uh, and good luck paying it down to zero. And oh, by the way, even if you got down to a zero balance, you're actually not investing in the future, right? That'd be the equivalent of paying down you know five or ten grand on your credit card uh, as a credit, right? So that you could kind of use it and, and not incur debt going forward. So um, it's a it's a huge challenge, uh, exactly to your to your point, James and. Uh, uh, and, and Ori. So yes, being able to start with modern technology, right, uh, is just such a, a huge advantage that a lot of uh, startups have. Um, Ori, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you've talked a lot about kind of the evolution of Voom. Uh, what's next? What does the future hold for you guys? So uh, that's a uh, super interesting question. Uh, we are very excited about the, the things coming next. Some of them you will probably see very soon. So uh, A, I recommend to stay tuned. Uh, but definitely our vision is to be, you know, the category leader for all new mobility insurance step by step. But we'll get there. Uh, but I'll definitely say that to stay tuned. Uh, and we have some big news coming in. Uh, I just, uh, if you guys don't mind, just want to touch on James' point uh, just a, a minute ago uh, regarding, you know, issuing you know, one line in 50 states, do it 50 times. Um, so first of all, James, I, I, I invite you to, to see a, a short demo of what, what, you know, how, how quickly we can deploy an additional state with the coverage that, uh, you know, with the lines that we have. So that's actually a, a very uh, fun, fun thing. So uh, I invite you to, to see that. But, but more than that, you've mentioned, you know, handling you know the, the 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 overhead so the overhead is basically one from the IT as as you've mentioned and we're discussed here but it's not only that right there are other processes that require manual work and updating uh and i think that one of the most dreadful things in insurance is uh, midterm adjustments so you know, even if you bind the policy now you have to change things and you have to do complicated uh, accounting just to understand if you need to refund or you need to prorate or those type of things and again that's something that technology should solve you don't have to do manual paperwork you just need to click a button from a menu of the all the options that you can do and everything should be just happen on the back end uh in 50 states so that's for, for me that's like the basic requirement and and it's it's interesting to see that it's not not the case all right so let's let's talk about the future let's kind of wrap up this conversation and discussing what it looks like going forward you've already made major strides in both the drone space and uh <clears throat> in the aviation space and then uh, you know becoming an ngga and offering uh, but both insurance products in the United States and obviously white labeled in in, uh, in Israel. So you, you you you've done quite a bit already. What's the long term goal? I mean, do you want to be a carrier? Do you want to do you want to raise the capital and actually go from being an MGA to being a carrier and go IPO like like uh, Lemonade did? I mean, what's the certain? Certainly, everybody would like to see that kind of share price and that kind of return to cap of capital to investors. What what's the long term uh, goal and strategy here? So I think that. Um, it, it's it's a good question, but I think that the question is not really if you want to become a carrier or stay an MGA. I think that's that's a, an important question, but you need to understand why would would someone opt to go to become a carrier. So margins could be one, um, and maybe flexibility can be two. 
But I think becoming a carrier is not a goal. Maybe it's a, a, a mean to an end. But for me, becoming uh, a, a big company, providing insurance for a lot of people and, and, and improving their lives is, you know, the, the main goal here and not necessarily become a carrier uh, versus becoming an MGA. So that, that may be a more of a tactical question. But yeah, conquering the world, is, is that a good answer? <laughs> well, you know, I grew up watching Pinky and the Brain, uh, an old uh, U.S. cartoon. Pinky and uh, the Brain. Yeah, course. Pinky and the Brain, 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 Brain. What are we going to do today, Pinky? Uh, to take over the world. Uh, so certainly their goal was world domination. We, you know, we, what we would love to see, of course, is a far more efficient insurance industry all around the planet. And I think we're certainly seeing in this the globalization of the insurance business. Uh, with the the amount of uh, uh, companies that are starting in other countries and starting to operate globally straight out of the gate, that's really exciting. And uh, we're seeing a lot of automation being driven and uh, a lot of proprietary in-house tech. I mean, building your own policy system is a massive deal and really changing the way that not only the customer experiences insurance, but the way that you experience insurance as a as an MGA. Um, and I'm sure that your carrier partners uh, appreciate the level of uh, sophistication that you have that you bring to bear with you. Uh, Rob, you want to uh, bring it home for us? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, Rory, it's a it's a pleasure having you on. Uh, thrilled to see all the progress that uh, you've made at at Boom. Um, maybe you could just touch on uh, uh, before we pivot to our news items. Obviously, uh, you're based in Israel. Uh, we've talked to several founders from Israel. It's known as Startup Nation. Uh, I know you're actually friends with Asaf from uh, Satya Labs, who we just spoke with uh, on an earlier uh, podcast. So maybe you can just talk about, um, you know, kind of the InsurTech ecosystem in uh, in Israel and how that's benefited you. So I think, first of all, the, 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 tech sis- the, the tech ecosystem as a whole is very strong here in Israel. And it's, uh, well, we're a, we're a relatively small country, but more than that, we have the tendency to become friends of each other. So we, we like to work together <laughs> across the industry. Uh, so that's something in general for the, for the tech ecosystem. And uh, I think that in the past few years, um, you've seen the insure tech ecosystem specifically grows. Uh, I think that might be the next uh, uh, cyber uh, to Israel. Uh, we used to be like a big cyber nation. I think maybe InsureTech is the, is the next uh, is, the, is our next goal, and I think this is super super helpful because as I've mentioned before, be, being a founder and being you know starting a startup that, that's a roller coaster, and when you have so you know so many smart people like Asaf uh, that you can pick up the phone, call them, and and you know discuss together the things that you can do. I think that's that's uh that's a great power that we have. And we, you know, we want, we, we like to help one, one another. Yeah, that's awesome. Obviously uh, there's been a lot of debate about Silicon Valley and, you know, is that the, 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 the place to be or not to be, does geography matter or not? And I think a lot of people have talked even right during this pandemic, a lot of people leaving you know, San Francisco and elsewhere, but right. That power of kind of being geographically uh, connected and, and having that network kind of a fact and definitely seeing the same thing coming out of uh, Tel Aviv and, and, and Israel. So it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, Ori. Thanks for, for sharing on that. Uh, so James, I've got a couple of news items this week that I wanted to, uh, to highlight for our audience members. Uh, the first one is, um, these are both uh, courtesy of, of coverage this week. So uh, fitness ring maker Aura uh, announced that they're raising a hundred million dollars. So I don't know, uh, James or Ori, if either of you have an Aura ring. I personally do not, but they've sold over five hundred thousand of them. I know they were. Uh, I kind of got on my radar from uh, the NBA and the bubble that they had in Orlando for their playoffs, and each player was required to to wear it, so it attracts you know their body temperature and, and health to help kind of help with the the COVID nineteen pandemic. But it does a lot more than that. It ca- calculates calories, steps, sleep, heart rate. Uh, has a battery life of five to seven days, which is really, really impressive. So uh, I know uh, a lot of folks are used to having their Apple watches and whatnot, but um, we've gotten down in the process of miniaturization to uh, to the ring level. So uh, it's nice to see them kind of taking the, the next step. I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on Aura, if either of you have them or have heard of it. Well, I have friends that have the Aura. I have so many wearables uh, from the Echo Frames to my Apple Watch, to I have a <clears throat> you know heart heart rate uh, Bluetooth bands that connect to my fitness. Uh, dude, I got a lot of wearables. <clears throat> I also, of course, have the ones you put on your head, like the Hololens, 
and uh, my Oculus Quest. And, you know, so so I have held off on getting another ring. Of course, for Texas Aggies, there's only, uh, you know, uh, one uh, one ring outside your outside your wedding band that matters. And that's the uh, that's that's this one right here. But <clears throat> I'll tell you this, if they can make an Aggie ring into a fitness tracker, I'd be all over that. Uh, it, that'd, that'd be pretty amazing. Uh, my friends who have the aura love it. <clears throat> they love the data that it gives. They love the, they love the information that it allows them to process. Uh, so of course the sleep track is all kinds of stuff on this. So I think the smaller you can make sensors, uh, the better, the more useful they are, the easier they are to wear. And you don't have to remember to strap so many things on before you leave the house, uh, between, between my glasses that talk to me with Alexa and then my, my watch that talks to me with Siri and then all this stuff, there's a lot of alerts going off. Uh, aura is pretty low key, meaning it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't bother you. So I think uh, I think that's what my friends like it so like about it so much. For me, it's a, it's a bit of a problem because my wife only lets me put only one ring. So one ring to rule them all. Uh, so uh, and then the uh, the second news item I have this week is uh, there was an announcement from uh, a company called Too Simple uh, that runs an autonomous freight network of uh, trucks. Um, that they are partnering with Liberty Mutual to uh, uh, this company is called Too Simple uh, and Liberty Mutual. They're going to partner to better understand how autonomous technologies perform in comparison to the same type of trucks driven manually by human drivers. So Too Simple auto, uh, operates a fleet of 50 trucks in Arizona, New Mexico, and yes, here in Texas. Um, and they are hoping to uh, expand uh, to go coast to coast by 2024. So uh, kind of put that on everyone's uh Radar. Uh, obviously, I'm sure many of you have heard about the autonomous trucks, but there's kind of uh, an interesting insurance angle here with Liberty and Mutual. It'll be interesting to uh, see if they release what their findings are, and if so, you know what the decrease in uh, frequency and severity is from autonomous trucks. That's great, Rob. Thank you so much for uh, for bringing the news to us. As always, uh, Liberty seems to be at the center of a lot of technology related conversations, and so. Uh, it's always good to see what they're uh, what they're up to and what they've been operating, uh, and uh, looks like this is a, a, a good partnership. Uh, of course, autonomous freight is something that there's been a lot of discussion for, and we haven't seen it move quite as quickly as many predicted it would. Right? We we, we uh, if you look at the old predictions from 2016 and 17 from the future conferences that I went to in 2016, 17, and 18, they said by 2021, 2022, there would be autonomous fleets of 18 wheelers rolling down the road and autonomous fleets of and we're not quite there yet, right? I mean, it's it's almost like they uh, they forget there's this uh, regulatory machine that has to approve all these things to happen, and uh, they're like, oh, oh oh yeah yeah we have to get government approval uh, to do things, and so uh, we're not we're not quite seeing uh, the 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 pace of innovation in that area as we thought we would, uh, or maybe we hoped we would the sci-fi nerds and all of us, but we are seeing movement uh, down the road. In fact, Rob. <clears throat> I'm super excited. I'm getting a vehicle with Super Cruise by GM today. And so uh, I will have some firsthand testing knowledge. Yes. I've, got, I've got plenty of experience with, with Teslas and their autopilot. I want to see how GM has tackled this, uh, this issue with Super Cruise. And I'm, I'm super excited to, to tell you uh, how, how it works once I get, to get a couple months under my belt. By the way, I think that GM has a very big R&D center here in uh, in Israel, and I think they're working on some of those uh, super crews and, and those type of things. Uh, and touching on you know on Liberty Mutual, so I think they're they're doing a great job. Everything related to autonomous uh, vehicles, um, and I think they're putting a lot of effort. And it's really really important for you know I think it's really really important for the industry to also have open-minded and innovative carriers. And I have a few friends over there, so that's a shout out to them. Great. Well, Rob, uh, thank you as always for bringing the news and thank you for uh, your discussion today and for introdu introducing us to Ori. Ori Blumenthal with Voom. Uh, Ori, thank you for jumping on from uh, from Israel today. And uh, I look forward to uh, coming to Tel Aviv. Uh, I fully intend to go to uh, to Tel Aviv and, and hit up your neck of the woods. I am fully vaccinated, have been for a couple months. So go get your vaccine, folks. Uh, and, uh, I, I want to, I want to head over there and, uh, and come hang out with you, uh, uh, and, uh, go, go, go experience that, that summer heat on the, on the beaches there and, and check it out. So I'm looking forward to a face to face with you. And of course you're, whenever you're in Texas, uh, Rob and I are only, a, only three hours away. Now we recognize, uh, that our, our portion of central Texas is the same size as Israel. 
for Texans, that's a very small distance. And so, so uh, we, we, we welcome you over to the, uh, to the Republic, I mean, the state of Texas. Uh, and of course, we look forward to seeing you in, uh, in Israel as soon as we can get over there. Uh, we appreciate your time. And again, people can find out more about your company, I believe, at voominsurance.com. Is that correct? That's true. That's true. Awesome. And, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It was a great time geeking out. Uh, and come to Tel Aviv. We'll, we'll have you here. We'll go to the beach. We'll surf a little bit. It's going to be a blast. And I think most people are vaccinated. So that's great. Yeah, I hear the I hear vaccine rates are outstanding over there. So uh, you 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 guys are basically back to a, a pretty Incredible. yeah a pretty normal sense of uh, of everyday life. And uh, same here in Texas, we have no real COVID restrictions to speak of. A few stores still require you put a mask on, but uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we we've already started conferences again here in Texas. I I went to one a couple weeks ago. It was great. Uh, R- Rob, I didn't realize that I was a conference addict until you, until they took him away from me. I always <laughs> said I could stop anytime I wanted. But then uh, when I was forced to stop, <laughs> I realized I was addicted to conferences. So I am ready to mainline some conferences uh, right here, buddy. It's time to it's time it's time to get back together. And I am I'm going to be at Insure Tech Connect, by the way, Rob. And we'll be exhibiting with our two products, Smart Compliance and Terra Claim. We have a claims management system t- called Terra Claim that we built, and we have a certificate of insurance tracking product called Smart Compliance. Both of which are products of JB Knowledge. We will be exhibiting at Insure Tech Connect in October in Las Vegas. I'm flying myself out there and maybe Rob Galbraith will ride with me if he's brave enough. Come on, brother. Just drive to College Station. Come ride with me. It'll be awesome. We're going to have a good time. Might have to do that. Might have to take you up on that. Come on, dude. You are are officially invited. Ori, are you coming to Insure Tech Connect? I might. I very might. I think I will. You got to come, dude. It's going to be huge. It's going to be sold out. I'm telling you. This thing is going to be... It's it's nuts. But But if I'm coming... Then I'm coming to Texas. Yeah, you are. Gonna fly together. You're going to ride with me. Flying to Houston, okay? Flying to Houston. Come stay with me. I'm up here in College Station, only an hour and a half away. We'll ride together. Take off. We're going to go to Vegas. It's going to be awesome. As long as you're, as long as you're cool with uh, playing a couple hands, of, uh, play a couple rounds of craps over there while we're in Vegas. Uh, you know, come, come, let's let's <laughs> let's go have some fun. It's going to be good. All right, folks. Evidently, you can see all three of us at Insure Tech Connect in Vegas. We'll see. I don't I don't know who's actually going to be there. I'm not going to commit them to that. But thank you for joining us for another episode of the Insure Tech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge. As always, happy to be discussing all things technology with you here on the podcast today. I've been your host, James Benham. That's jamesbenham.com with my co-host, Rob Galbraith, the most interesting man in insurance, endofinsurance.com. Thanks to Jim Greenley, our podcast producer, Kara Dalton, our creative producer. And thank you for joining us. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride. Geek out. See you next time.